Good morning. Please rise in body or in spirit as we join together in our call to worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The light of Christ has come into the world. We will follow the light when it shines brightly in the night sky, when it glows dimly on the horizon. When it leads down When our journey brings us finally to the heart of God. May our hands open in generous spirit. May our mouths open in generous spirit. Good morning. Um, with a new season means a new first worship bulletin and some new first worship songs. Um, the opening song we have in, in this Epiphany bulletin is the Lakeshore. And um, one of the, the you know, amazing and meaningful things about gone to other music um, to see music to sing that in either the so um, what I might encourage you to do this melody over you know the weeks to come so familiar encourage you to and it's perfectly okay to have both at the same time part of that um, amazing and holy uh, that we love so I encourage you to give it a try um, uh, Lord you have come to the lake shore Welcome to Old South Church in Boston. Welcome to First Worship on this January. We are celebrating the and also worship season. So we are blessed today to be joined by Phil Stern, who will be offering our stewardship reflection. And uh, we also have a lot going on in the life of the church. But no matter who you are, or no matter who you love, no matter your spiritual journey, we are glad you are here. Whether you're a longtime friend of Old South or a first time visitor, our worship is made the more beautiful and more pleasing in God's sight because you are here. And we'd love to know who is with us. So if you'd please take up the black friendship pads at the end of each row and jot down a little note. Let us know that you are here today. We'd love to show you the hospitality that this place is known for. 
I also invite you to take a look at your bulletin, at the announcements in there. There's a lot going on, including an upcoming blood drive, opportunity next week for Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, and also at 10 o'clock today, following the service on the second floor, our forums start back up again. We'll be looking at theology, and especially the process theology of John Cobb Jr. Hope you can join us for that. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Uh, Rich Hassinger is going to share our scripture lesson for us this morning. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east and have come to pay him, homage, pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all of the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in the east until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Many of my best memories in life are connected with Old South. My family and I have been attending for over 30 years, and I've been a member for about 25, so I've had plenty of time to make those connections. Many involve my children. Um, conducting the children's chime choir when Emma and Benjamin were in grade school, uh, playing Christmas carols on the piano during the pageant with Kate Minshew, Amy, Amy Budka, and, and Pam Roberts, and others just connected to music, um, playing the oboe alongside Sam O and on cello and Mitchell Crawford on piano just recently, uh, or uh, previously singing the Scola Cantorum with my wife Susan under Prince Harry's leadership. I cherish those related to committees on which I've served. Reading a sermon by Quinn Caldwell on liminal spaces while on an associate minister search committee. I, I, I had to look up the word liminal. I don't know. I, I didn't know what it meant. Uh, traveling with the trustees to New York for the auction of the Bay Psalm book. Planning and attending church retreats in the warm fellowship of the Christian Formation Committee led by Marin Batalden including a game of tennis between, uh, with Ann and, and Phil Deering when they were first dating, I believe, um, or with Paul Kunstner negotiating the repair of our building when it was damaged by the MBTA. Finally, some memories don't 
fit in any broader category, just uh, the opportunity to ring the tower bell on the rare occasions when David Bogan isn't here. Joining in the prayer chain led by Ruth Pertillo as we prayed over the vision for the 21st century. And tearfully receiving a Boston Marathon runner's scarf chosen by Diane Goucher and Marilyn Adams in the year after the bombing. So, it's clear that I'm deeply connected to you now, but it wasn't always that way. 30 years ago, after being focused on career and self, I felt a need for a spiritual home. When Susan and I had our first child, we wanted her to be brought up in the church. We started attending Old South and even enrolled our daughter Emma in the Old South preschool upstairs. But still, we didn't join because we felt like just visitors renting apartments in the Back Bay or South End. And per perhaps for some of you, that's where you are today. But finally, when we bought a house and moved out of town to Newton, Emma, who was then a five-year-old, said, you've changed everything else, Daddy. My house, my friends, my city, my school. Can't we just go to my church? Well, okay. <laughs> that sealed the deal. Now, I mean, in retrospect, <laughs> Retrospect, smart parents might have known that that was one gift they could give of continuity to their daughter, but you know, we were in the slow bus on that one. Um, and it's not, it's not really a coincidence that we joined in the year that my father died. Old, Old, Old South became my home when I needed it most. I realized that I loved the honesty and integrity in preaching, the constant listening for God's still speaking voice. And I wanted a church community that had Jesus at its center and that took the Bible seriously while also welcoming rational thought and heartfelt questions. In his children's message later, Sean will say that church is our map and our star that leads us to Jesus. Over the years while on this journey, I've come to see Old South as much more important to me than just the place where I come for community and worship. I want to be all in for Old South for two fundamental reasons. The first is that I know I need Old South because you bring out my better self that would otherwise be dominated by my more rational nature. And second, I know that the world needs Old South. More on that in a bit. My general nature is not uh, all that spiritual. I tend to make decisions on a very rational basis. I weigh costs and benefits. For much of my day, I negotiate always looking for win-win solutions, but certainly looking to protect my company's interests. But as much as this is my general tendency, I, I know that I need more. It's satisfying intellectually, but not emotionally. So I'm a big believer in the body has many parts view of the Christian community. I have certain skills based on my God-given gifts, education, and experience. And those enable me to lead meetings, examine financial statements, build spreadsheets, make logical arguments, but they don't make me the best caregiver. I listen for facts and figures pretty well, but alas, though I try, I often don't listen well, terribly well, for feelings and emotions. And that's one of the key reasons that I need you. In today's reading, the wise men follow a star to find the Christ child of Bethlehem. For me, you, the Old South Congregation, you are my star pointing out that path that Jesus Christ set for us. Many of you have served on a light on that path for me. I've watched as you've given your gifts of love and laughter, your gifts of doing mercy and loving justice, and your gifts of listening and caring. You've shown me when I was wrong. I, I was one of those folks, um, for some of you, you may not believe that the, the, uh, the new century hymnal was at one time new. Uh, it was for me. Um, I was one of the folks that resisted it. I didn't like the new language. I later realized that that book was visionary. Its inclusive language ensures that all people feel that they are equal in God's eye. I've also been truly inspired by Old South's way of making decisions, led by prayerful discernment. And when I've given my time to participate in and help build this community, you've challenged my thinking, expanded my perspective, and kept me grounded. Our covenant as a church community keeps me from falling away. It satisfies both the rational and spiritual sides of my being. 
Okay, but why does the world need Old South? This particular institution is sorely needed to fill a void that is open between two very powerful forces. On the one hand, we have increasingly fundamentalist religious groups who cling to their beliefs so tightly that they must exclude others. And on the other, we have an increasingly secular world that scoffs at religious belief, particularly when they see it creating such division and even hatred. To maintain their relevance, many sects of religion are turning away from science. They're afraid to listen to, much less accept, the objective truths emanating from scientific inquiry. Consequently, they villainize any who endorse concepts which they find existentially threatening. The face, in the face of unrelenting change in their jobs, communities, familiar technologies, these groups refuse to accept any change in their beliefs. As they reject any and all adaptation, they must become more fundamental, not listening for God's still speaking voice. Instead of looking to find common ground, leaders of these groups find power in generating fear of the other. And this fear, which has been true for millennia, is easily manipulated by politicians. In this type of religious belief, non-literal interpretations and those who don't fit in must be excluded and excoriated. So on the other side of the void, the secular world sees that type of mi religion as misguided, hateful, and increasingly quite dangerous. And unfortunately, the secular world hears almost exclusively about that absolutist, no questioners or dissenters tolerated type of religion. Would you agree with me that the vast majority of the news today about religion is about, how a, is, is about how a fundamentalist belief either generated some enduring hatred, prompted an individual to violence, or led to some exclusion, exclusionary behavior? Many people associate Christianity with an angry, Muslim-hating, anti-gay, prosperity gospel preaching, and potentially violent mindset. So, there's a big void. And that's where the world requires Old South to fill. Old South's open and affirming congregation presents a radical welcome in this world of exclusion. But we're not just making it up as we go along. We're still deeply grounded in the Bible. We stick to scripture, but don't count on hearing the same old interpretation you've heard a hundred times before. We're that confluence of the sense of the eternal and an ability to adapt. We are constantly listening to God's still speaking voice. But for an organization that's over 350 years old, we actually change pretty rapidly. Some of you are, are part of families that have been here for generations, but many of you are, are brand new. Families are constantly joining. We've had very few senior ministers and have been, and have been blessed with the most amazing people in that role. But we've also had so many other wonderful assistant and associate ministers who are constantly shaping who we are. You, my friends in faith, are working in so many parts of our community on matters of justice and mercy that you project God's light throughout Boston's area and indeed beyond. So, as I see it, and I hope you do it as well, the world really needs Old South. It's seven days a week open door. It's openness to change grounded in abiding Christian faith and a loving God, and its deep connection to the spirit living within each and every one of us. So, Susan and I have pledged financially to Old South for many years, and we've increased our financial gift every year for the last 15. While this has been challenging, since our resources have not increased substantially, and we've had kids in college during that time, what we're doing here is simply too important not to contribute to it. For those of you here today who haven't found a way yet to connect with the Old South community, and for those of you who have not yet been able to pledge, I've been there. In fact, I was there for at least five years before joining in the covenant. And you need to know, it's okay. You're welcome no matter where you are on your journey. But, 
when you're ready to join in this community following the star, when you're ready to form some of your own lifelong memories as part of the life of this church, we'll be traveling on that path right by your side. to the time in our service where we lift our prayers to God, trusting that God hears our prayers spoken and unspoken. In just a moment, I'll begin with a pastoral prayer, and then I'll invite you to share the prayers on your hearts this day, after which I will do my best to repeat your prayer, and then I'll say, God, in your mercy, and you're invited to respond, hear our prayers. Let us pray. God of wonder and mystery, God of the stars and the universe, God of winding ways and straight paths, we gather today with gratitude for the gift of your constant presence, your trustworthy guidance, and your daring risk-taking with us. You dare to love us, to care for us, to walk with us, though at times we do not perceive you. On our own journeys toward the stars and guiding points you put before us, you continue to lead us forward, guiding us by the teachings of Jesus to seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly in your loving shadow. As we struggle with the political wranglings of this world, the wars waged for both justice and for greed, the violence committed daily against the innocent, let alone the pain of broken relationships and loss, you remain steadfast in your care and devotion for your entire creation throughout the universe. We lift these prayers of our hearts to you this day. For Catherine, God in your mercy, For Aaron, God in your mercy. For Paul, God in your mercy. For Katrina, God in your mercy. For Amelia, God in your mercy. For the people of Ukraine, God in your mercy.
pray for healing for Lynn, God in your mercy. For families, God in your mercy. For Larry, God in your mercy. For peace, God in your mercy. For Janet, God in your mercy. We pray, O oh God, for peace in this world, the kind of peace in which we celebrate diversity and bravely are challenged by adversity and share in the joy that is to be found everywhere. We pray for those who are lonely that you might lead us to reach out and be friends. We pray for those who are hungry that you might lead us to offer sustenance. We pray for those who are lost that you might lead us to give hope and direction. And we pray for ourselves that we might continue on this journey, learning the lessons you offer and living as you would have us live. In confidence and gratitude for your love and presence we pray. And we all say, Amen. This season of Epiphany, God opens us to the treasure of God's grace, and in response with thanksgiving and gratitude, we offer our lives, our stories like Phil did, our gifts like the Magi long ago. As God sent a star to enlighten the wise and a child to topple a tyrant, may we become wise enough to seek the blessedness in one another, and even among those the world might consider the least of these. This stewardship season, I'm doing some creative thinking about how I can better use my resources. One thing our family has been able to do this year is make some changes to conserve our energy use. When we needed to replace our heating system, we were able to utilize a rebate from MassSave to install a heat pump system. And while that's a big investment up front, we know this will keep our energy costs down in future years. We are also advocating and awaiting the day when our town launches its community electricity program, similar to community choice electricity, which most of you have access to right now, and which you can learn more about in the announcements in your bulletin. We will be ready to sign up as soon as it's available, and we know how energy costs are skyrocketing for everyone, and we're doing what we can to reduce both our energy consumption and participate in these innovative programs. And the money that we save we're gonna turn around and add that to our giving here at church. Right now, that looks like a 10% bump to what we pledged last year. This way, we're taking money out of the pocket of big oil and investing it in the bigger picture, in religious education for our kids, in worship that feeds our hearts, in advocacy and action to fight the climate crisis and housing crisis and systemic injustice, 
and in grants for local organizations that are really doing things to bring positive change to the lives of people in this city. We are grateful to God for the resources in our hands and the opportunities before us. And so we're stepping out bravely in a spirit of generosity to see the amazing things that God and all of us together can do. However you support Old South, whether through an annual pledge that helps us plan for the future or through a one-time gift today, I hope you will give with that same spirit of brave generosity and with excitement for God's hopeful future. This morning's offering will now be given. If you would raise your hands in a posture of blessing over this table, let us bless these elements. Come, God, come, dive deep in these cups, twine yourself with this bread, that this meal may be for us food for the journey and an inspiration to hope and peace in the world. And we all say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And go find your people. We remember a Thursday night when Jesus showed us what it is to truly live in a spirit of gratitude, to give of ourselves Christ, his body, his very heart, his spirit, to all of us through this meal. He took the bread and giving thanks to God, he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. And then he took the cup and giving thanks to God, he blessed it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink, this is the covenant of for, for you and for all. Whenever you drink it, remember me. The bread which I've broken contains wheat and egg. If those are not for you, we'll have a gluten-free option in the middle. Our cups contain only non-alcoholic juice, so there need be no barriers between you and these tastes of God's grace. If you're still not sure whether what you're at this table, maybe you're not 
for any church, maybe you're not baptized, or maybe you've done something that, even though the grace of God extends over the whole universe, you think it would surely pass you by. On that night, there was one who denied Jesus, pray him, and all the... He would come to this table is... In just a moment, we'll invite you to one of our communion stations. We'll hand you a piece of and then consume both elements together. Then make your way around to one of our candle lighting stations to light a candle. The feast for all things are ready. Let us join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us using the words most familiar and meaningful to you. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Hi, kids. It's Pastor Sean. Hi, kids. It's Pastor Sean. Have you or your families ever gone on a trip somewhere that you had never been before? The first thing we do is pull out a map or a map on an app. The map shows us exactly how to get where we want to go, whether we are walking, driving in a car, or taking the T. As we travel, we keep looking at the map so that we know exactly where we are and to make sure we aren't lost. We follow the directions that the map or the app gives us and use those directions to guide us. After Jesus was born, some wise men heard that a king had been born. This wasn't just any king, but the king of kings, someone super special. So they wanted to find him so that they could worship and honor him. They went looking for him, but they didn't have a map and they didn't really know where he was born. So God gave them a star to guide them. So the wise men followed the directions of the star, and it led them right to Jesus. When they found him, they gave him gifts, bowed down, and worshipped him. Like the Magi, we are still seeking Jesus every day. We don't look for him in Bethlehem or anywhere else that Jesus did his work. We don't need a map to help us find him. We don't even need a star. We find our way to Jesus by going to worship and church school, by reading our Bibles, and by praying every day. When we do those things, we find Jesus in unexpected ways. Church is our map and our star that leads us to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, we seek you today because we want to worship and honor you but we can't find our way on our own. So help us to pay attention to those guiding stars that lead our way to you. And we all say, Amen. And now may God bless you and keep you. May the very face of God shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God's presence embrace you and give you eternal peace. And we all say, Amen. Amen.